let's talk a bit about um, a curious uh, point of your biography, which is the fact that you wrote porno uh, for a living for a while, which is very interesting. But People sex. are very interested in that. They always ask about that. <laughs> and and I badly they, paid, I presume. <laughs> I think they read about it on the internet, but people always ask about that. It was such a, uh, such a, a sort of insignificant and un uninteresting thing to do, but people are fascinated by it. I don't, I don't know why, because it's not an interesting thing to do at all, actually. It's like writing advertising. You know, there isn't anything else you can do with it. You can just you know, do it and say it. You can't then take it over there or take it over there or do that or be creative with it. You know, they, if you're writing pornography, it's just for that. You know, it's like it doesn't leave much to the imagination. <laughs> it doesn't leave much to the imagination, and you can't. You have to. Do I mean, well, suppose they don't have sex, the couple. You know, and then they decide to talk instead. That would be much more interesting in the story. But the the editor wouldn't want that. Why? Why? Why have they not fucking it? You know, it's like, why are they not, when are they going to do it? And you say, well, I got really interested in this conversation between them. And then they decided to go to the park, you know, and then they wanted to have a beer, you know. And he would say, well, when are they going to fuck? It's hopeless, <laughs> it's pointless. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm not sure if that gave you some, you, you, the, there are not many writers who um, can write about sex and do it well. I think it's one of the most, <coughs> probably one of the most difficult endeavors for a writer is to, to do it without uh, bad taste or, um, or, or badly. Uh, but you clearly do it well. Uh, do you think that part of your <laughs> life gave you some access to, to that kind of writing? Or, uh, or do, you, do you feel sex is an important part of, of a book? I would never, the relationship I would never write about sex now. I mean, I wouldn't write about, you know, she had large breasts, his penis rose up, stuff like that. I mean, I wouldn't do that. I mean, I, what I would write about, what inter well, the only interesting thing about sex is not the positions or even the acts. It's what's happening between the, the people, really, what's happening in their minds and, their, and what they want from each other, you know. I was fascinated by this. I was talking to a journalist about it this afternoon about the case of General Petraeus. You know, when he has sex, the war in Afghanistan is lost um, uh, and his career is destroyed. It's a most fascinating case, but he really loves this woman. He's got to have this woman more than he wants America to win the war. Even the Taliban comment on the fact that he should be stoned for copulating with a woman, not his wife, and so on. So really, it's what's... It, it's, it's the whole context of the act that's fascinating. You know, the fact that they copulate is irrelevant, but that is the moment when their lives are destroyed, and it's brilliant. But the whole story is about all the other stuff around it. So uh, you, you can't write about the act itself without being banal and repetitive. But the context is fascinating. In Anna Karenina, what's fascinating about this relationship is that they are destroyed by it, mm -hmm. that it has huge meaning and significance in terms of their, their, their lives. So you have to see the context, it seems to me, rather but than... But you are talking about passion, then, not sex. Well, That's sex, passion. Uh, yeah, I mean, in my experience, it's part of passion, mm -hmm. I find. But sexual passion <laughs> can coexist. <laughs> That's what interests you. What? A sexual passion. Well, desire, what you want from Crazy another. Crazy things that, like betrayals, that people do for love or for sex or for passion. Well, the, and the price you might want to pay for it, mm -hmm. what it might cost you. Then it's interesting what the risk is, why it would have to be risky, why, why other people would have to betray, be betrayed for it to be so interesting, and so on. And then it really matters. I mean, the great 19th century novels are all about sex, but the, the sexuality is in the context of what it costs what it means. Sex relates to death, another one of the big themes, and age. What's your own and death and age, what, at, at this time in your life, what's your relationship with those, those themes? Well, I wrote two films, one called The Mother and another called Venus, made, both made by a, a very good director, Roger Michel, about Roger Michel. Um, the mother that featured James Bond, in fact. <laughs> Daniel Craig with his trousers off. You have, you know, you discover, <laughs> you did the same with Daniel Day-Lewis. That's right. <laughs> so um, you put them in your films before they become famous. <laughs> well, they're cheaper before they become famous. Um, 
I was fascinated by what it would be to be a woman who is um, in her 70s, who decides to have a sexual relationship with, with, a, with a younger man and what that would cost in terms of her family, in terms of her life, and what that would mean. And that would have a lot of meaning for her. So it's a really big deal for her to, 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 to begin that relationship. And again, with Peter O'Toole in, in Venus, his relationship with a young girl, you know, what actually really goes on between the two of them, their conversations, their affection, their passion for one another, and so on. Um, and, the, and the relation between age and sexuality and feeling and desire and friendship and so on. Um, I'm fascinated by all that. And I'm writing about it again in a novel I've written and a film that I've just done called Weekend is about a couple in their 60s who go to Paris for a dirty weekend. They've been married for a long time and about what happens between them. So, you know, as you get older, the, the subjects, illness, death, sexuality, class, race, they're, they're, you know, they're still fascinating. But actually, as you get older, it gets more interesting because in a sense the price is higher, it means more. You know, are you going to make love again? Are you going to fall in love again? Is this going to be the last time? You know, what is this going to mean to you in your life and so on? So I think it actually gets more exciting, all that stuff, as you get older. You, you know, you fall in love when you're 20, you know you're going to fall in love 10 more times. But well, when you're 70, what does it mean then? What does it do to you? Which explains the Petraeus thing all over again. <laughs> yeah, my hero, General Petraeus. No, no finer man no uni in a uniform. Um, what about family? Family, um, that's another thing that becomes different as you get, as you grow old, because uh, the family, your parents, you become a parent yourself, so you build your own family. Your relationship with your own family, uh, your father and uh, and uh, the rest of the family, you had uh, some disagreement, or your sister had some big disagreement with you. Um, did that matter to you, or when you wrote uh, My Hear in His Heart about your father, uh, what were you trying to accomplish? Trying to make peace with, uh, with that man? Uh, and the family didn't react, your own mother didn't react too well to that. What, what's your take on that now? Would you do it again in, on the do, same terms? Do, that, do, that, do book, what? that book? Yeah, of course. I mean, if you speak, it's dangerous. It causes a nuisance. Anybody in a family who perks up and says, excuse me, this is my experience, everybody else in the family becomes enraged by your words. Uh, and a good thing, too. If anybody speaks, you know, you can see it in a family when the father dies, for instance, let's say. The rest of the family, the, all the kids start squabbling amongst themselves and they say, my father was this, and the other person says, my father was that. You can see all the animosity is suddenly drawn out. It's like a civil war. You know, when Gaddafi dies, the whole thing collapses into a civil war. And the same thing happens in a family. And people start to become enraged with one another. I mean, in a sense, that has to happen. And people have to speak. It's worse if they don't speak, in a sense. The hate is deeper and is more corrosive if people don't speak. When you speak, other people become annoyed, but when you don't speak, it's more, more enraging in, a, in, a, in, a, in another sense. I mean, you might have to have these conflicts. It's not as though you could live a life without any conflicts at all and everything was always all right and everybody agreed. In a sense, what we're talking about is how to have conflicts that don't destroy people, but are worth having where you can have these conversations and then you feel that you, 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 you have spoken and that you have been yourself. You are a father yourself these days. How would you react uh, to a son of yours writing about you? I don't know. I haven't read. Uh, my, my kids can hardly read and write as it is. I can't imagine them doing They're it. But <laughs> I, I, They're not following the profession, are they? Well, there are lots of kids, though, who do write books about, you know, my dad, the bastard, what a, the writer, the famous writer, bastard. You, you see lots, lots of those, particularly by the Cheever children and so on. Um, you know, and the Mela kids, and, 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 and so on. Um, you know, if you're an advocate of speaking, then people must speak. I mean, when I, I remember reading one of my father's novels about five years ago, in which I turned up as a teenager, um, and I was really shocked by, by, by how ridiculous he, he as a, what a ridiculous figure he saw me as. Um, and I thought, well, that's how I looked. I mean, so what if you're offended? Yeah, uh, 
in spite of your huge success, um, do you think you, when your father died you were still saying the things you wrote as not quite literature because you were writing about drugs and rock and roll and sex and, and gay relationships and whatever? Or did you know that you were a real writer? Did they respect you as being part of that grand mot literature? It was very difficult between me and my dad because he wanted me to be a writer, but he wanted to be a writer himself more, and he thought he was a better writer than I was. And he thought you know, I was the kid and he was the smart one, and it rather annoyed him when I became successful. Um, and I was very, very frightened of humiliating him as well. Um, and he did get humiliated, and he couldn't write really, but you couldn't really say that to him. And he thought he was writing deep, serious, philosophical books. And I was writing crap about people taking drugs and wearing velvet trousers. <laughs> um, and I had to sort of remain in that position. And it was very difficult for me and humiliating for me and difficult for him. It was a real conflict between us, actually. Um, and it still is, to a certain extent, in my mind. You know, what you don't want to do is to humiliate your parent. You want the parent to be all right so that you can fuck off and live your own life. If the parent is really disturbed by you and put down by you, it's, 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 it's really tricky. Um, it, was, it was, yeah, yes. I mean, in a sense, what you want is a really strong father. You can see that with Kafka. What he wants is a really strong father who just goes away and lives his life, you know, with his woman, his wife, and doesn't bother you. My father was really dependent on me. He'd come from Pakistan, from India. He, didn't really understand Britain. He was always a foreigner in Britain, and I knew Britain, knew how it worked, and I became a successful writer. I think it was very disturbing for Dad, actually. In many ways, uh, that replicates the relationship in, in different mode of Naipaul with his own father, because Naipaul's father was uh, a failed writer himself, a journalist, yeah. but a failed writer. Yeah. Did you ever think about that? Yeah, I did. I remember writing to Vidya Naipaul about this, I think in the 80s, went writing him a letter about that, to which, of course, he didn't reply, although he <laughs> quite characteristically, although his wife rang me up and said, Vidya had noted your letter and was very interested in it. Um, yeah, yeah, I so think you never, so. So you never spoke with him or anything? Well, I think a lot of successful art artists might have parents who were unsuccessful artists. And in a way, your whole job as the child, as the son, as the kid, is to try and, as it were, uh, make it all right for the father, as it were, to be the father's hero. And then you realize the father looks at you and thinks, you bastard, you did what I was, what I was supposed to be doing. So it, it's, it's, it's a very complex and quite painful thing. Yeah, that, about pleasing the father. What about pleasing the mother? <laughs> well, my mom is, is easy to please, and she's still alive, and she, 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 you know, she wishes me well. There isn't that fundamental conflict. You know, we didn't disagree. We weren't trying to do the same thing. She's just pleased that I've done well, and it's fine. She's really proud. She wasn't operating, as it were. We weren't rivals, and we've never been rivals. It's never been a, a relationship of hate, let's say, that there was between me and my dad. That's why those relationships are so interesting for me to write about father-son relationships, because the amount of hate there is in the relationship that makes it so complicated and difficult. You know, my relationship with my mum is more or less entirely loving. So in a sense, there isn't anything much to say about it. Uh, let's go now to uh, movie making and, s and plays. You wrote plays, you wrote screenplays, you were a writer in residence at the Royal Court. Uh, so y you are used to work uh, isolated as a writer and in an ensemble, in a group, in a collective work. Um, what's the difference? What do you like best? Or do you need both? It's all a pain in the ass. <laughs> I mean, I'm doing a film now with Roger Michel called Weekend. He's shooting it at the moment in Paris. But I, I haven't been there, and he doesn't want me hanging around, and he's not speaking to me at the moment, and I don't think I'm speaking to him. Um, why not? Are you mad at because you've, I don't know why you've done so many things together. I know. I've annoyed him, and he's annoyed me, and we're not speaking, but he's in Paris making a film of my story. Um, and then he'll come back to London with the film, and then we'll argue. And we, you, you know, it's a very good creative relationship, but it's quite painful and difficult. You know, he's a strong, grown-up man, and and, uh, and and so am I, and we, we really disagree about things. Um, the only measure of that kind of relationship is the fact that can you do good work together? You know, can you do stuff together that you can't do on your own? 
does he bring stuff to my scripts um, that I think makes them better? And I think he does. And he can direct stuff of mine that makes him a better director. So we really need each other, even though we really irritate each other. So the irritate, as we get older, we get more irritated by each other. Uh, but you have to hold off the irritation in order to get the good creative stuff. It's quite difficult. You can see why people in pop groups and bands always fall out, because they really need each other, very dependent on each other, and they hate the fact that they need each other and depend on each other. They can't do that stuff on your own. That's the truth. You can't do it on your fucking own. You know, I think as a novelist, you can be a sort of goal, because you do write the whole thing yourself. But even then, you need editors and you work with other people. And... Um at the same time, you did, you did work well with Patrice Chéreau, who's a difficult character in itself. Was that because he was French? Because uh, you didn't speak French and he didn't speak very good English? You wrote a beautiful piece about that and you seem to get along really well. <laughs> Your I like, intimacy. <laughs> I like Patrice. When I first met Patrice Chéreau, he couldn't speak any English at all. So we used to have dinner all the time to speak. And I can't speak French and I'm too lazy to bother. So we just used to sit there, and I liked his face, actually, and I got to know his face a lot, and we just, I used to gaze at him adoringly, and he used to look very worried about everything. Um, and in the end, I said to him, look, you've got my stories, just go and do whatever you like, it's fine, I really like you, I like your face, you've got good actors. I mean, to a certain extent, if you're working with a director like that, you must let them do what they want to do, that's fine. That's a different kind of relationship. I mean, I didn't write the script for that film, so the script was written by somebody else. You get uh, David Bowie to do the soundtrack uh, of one of your films. You get a cameo by Mick Jagger. <laughs> uh, Mick Jagger is in one of your books. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And um, so you became a character of pop culture yourself. Yeah, but I wouldn't only, you know, I, I know I'm much more serious than that. I'm interested in real things. I'm, I'm, I liked pop stars because they were my heroes and idols when I was a, a teenager, and I liked David Bowie himself, and he's a very serious... Did, did you have any idea that he was uh, living in the same area as you, <laughs> that he was coming from, Bro from Bromley as well? Yeah, we knew that because there were pi I went to the same school as Bowie, and there were pictures of him in, the, you know, in those big school pictures. And the teachers used to say, you know, if you don't do your homework, you'll end up like that fucking David Jones, as <laughs> they used to say. Total um, failure. <laughs> so he was a big hero to us. And he dressed like a girl and he wore makeup and, you know, it was outrageous. He was a huge hero to us then. Um, but I've never wanted to be a pop star. I take writing very seriously. Uh, one last question about uh, one of your stories that uh, I find very interesting, which is weddings and beheadings. Um, oh, yeah. It has to do with the uh, well, the, the whole beheading industry in, the, in Iraq at the time. You beheading were the beheading industry <laughs> is a very good way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. and you were uh, you opposed the Iraq war from uh, the the very first day. Um, there are always wars in the Middle East, and the beheading seemed to have stopped for a while. But uh, there was a problem with, with that story because, and the BBC and Alan Johnson at the same time. I mean, the BBC was trying what to adapt the story, made the, uh, and make a movie about it. The story with the, the weddings and beheadings is a story. I, I used to stay up late at night getting stoned, and there were always people being beheaded <laughs> on TV. I mean, you didn't see the actual thing, and I, d I really don't want to see that. But you'd see some guy holding up some bloke's head from, s and the man was always from Surrey. And I thought, the person you don't see in this picture is the person doing the film, you know, the cameraman. And I thought, I, I know cameramen and worked in films, so I thought I'd write a story about a bloke, you know, with his hands shaking, having to make the video. So I wrote this story, and it was um, to be read on the BBC. And then it, oh, was, it was to be read, just read. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, part of a competition. And, uh, but the BBC banned it because one of their guys was, uh, had been uh, kidnapped and they kept saying, ringing me up and saying, he's going to be beheaded tomorrow, so we can't read your fucking story about a bloke being beheaded, can we? And actually, a few, few months later, I met him and had dinner with him. He was a really nice bloke. Um, he said he, they weren't going to behead him. But uh, I, I, I guess it's a remark about um, the trouble that writers might cause and how useful and important that might be. 
Um, the question is, what's the relation between writing, say, novels and stories and so on, and writing films? Well, actually, I am at the moment. I'm writing a novel, and I uh, and and I'm writing uh, a film for working title at the same time. And I'm doing. I was doing the novel and the film at the same time, and so I'd write a scene of the novel, and then I'd do a bit of the film on the same day. And I have to say, I found it really hard to do. Really, div I thought it'd be really clever instead of writing a novel and then you know, two years later writing the film version of it. I thought I'd do it all at the same time. And I found it very, very difficult to do, really hard to do. Because novels don't really translate into films in any direct way, as you will see from, you know, having watched, say, Anna Karenina or whatever. They don't, it doesn't go straight in. You've got to reconceive it in some other way. So I, c I learned a lot about how, f how novels don't trans transfer in in into films automatically. You have to rethink the whole thing. And my films are also, I guess, quite literary in the sense that there's a lot of talking. My films are really about what happens when people talk to one another. And it's what, when people really talk to one another, say, rather than chase each other with a gun or beat each other up or chase each other in a car, when they talk to each other, which is much more dangerous than shooting someone, I th you know, I th that's much more interesting. And that's, in that sense, my films are more literary, I guess, than, than, the, 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 than, a, than a lot of people. So there is a relation between the two but I'm not entirely sure how it works, but they do feed each other, yeah.